Hello and welcome to this comparison and explanation of the difference between black powder and smokeless powder, which are arguably the two extremes of gunpowder. If you see any gunfire today, it's likely to be using smokeless powder. The obvious giveaway to this is that you see a flash of light and not a plume of smoke. If you go back a little over 120 years, you're likely to see a mixture of powder in use. Some would be smokeless powder that we're familiar with today, while some would be black powder. This black powder is the same sort of propellant used from the start of gunpowder weapons through the Napoleonic Wars, American War for Independence, American Civil War, Seven Years' War, and even in some places into the 20th century. Where modern propellants are called smokeless powder, the earlier options are called gunpowder or black powder. This should make clear that at some point in late 19th century or early 20th century, a change happened. In fact, we know that the invention itself of smokeless powder was in 1884. This was a nitrocellulose compound that was made for small arms, or effectively rifles and pistols. It made practically no smoke, and, well, that was its use. However, when you use this in large caliber weapons like artillery and tank guns or cannons, they can all produce enough smoke to be apparent, it's just an issue of volume when we're talking about small arms. Uh, prior to this, uh, let's say, uh, smokeless powder development, a much more crude product by comparison was used. Uh, black powder is a mixture of sulfur, carbon, and saltpeter. The carbon is often in the form of charcoal, and saltpeter is potassium nitrate. It is generally a granular mixture of 75% nitrates, 15% charcoal, and 10% sulfur. The uh, nitrates generally come in the form of potassium nitrate, which is what's going to provide oxygen for the reaction, the charcoal is going to provide carbon for the reaction, and the sulfur is going to act as a fuel, but it's also able to uh, lower the temperature required to, well, start the entire reaction. A gunpowder is generally considered a low explosive, although historically it has been considered useful in mining, but even then, it's nothing compared to something like, say, TNT. The reason for this is that rather than detonate or explode, it deflagrates. That is a fancy way of saying burns quickly. If you want something to be propelled, like, say, a bullet, this is useful. Whereas if you just want to make something go bang, well, you want an explosive. So this is largely why they, well, differentiate them the way they do the other reason is, well, for most individuals, holding a firearm, if you had an explosive in there, you wouldn't have a bullet going down the range or at a target, or rather you would have the gun exploding into your face and being more like a claymore. So again, another reason why deflagration is more important than detonation for this. The earliest, let's say, uh, mass-produced gunpowder was in the 15th century Europe. And we're referring to this in use as a weapon, rather than in displays for things like fireworks, where China is certainly far ahead of Europe. The ingredients were fairly standardised. Although standardisation was one issue, but preparation was more of a problem, as it was, at least at this time, very, very liable to explode during preparation. And so production of gunpowder was a very much regulated industry. The whole process of creating black powder had them mixed together in either a mortar or pestle, or a sort of mill for about 24 hours. If these were then transported over an extended period of time, they may need to be mixed again. The other, let's say, issue with this is that a gunpowder is somewhat hydroscopic, that is, it draws in water, and well, gunpowder needs to be dry to burn, therefore if gunpowder wasn't stored correctly or transported in humid environments, it would effectively become moist, and when that happens, it would fire correctly. Unlike, let's say, a modern propellants, for lack of a better way to phrase it, black powder needs significantly more time to burn. Rather than just combusting immediately, like, say, a car engine piston would, it gradually burns. It's more similar in that respect to, say, burning alcohol or an oil. As a result, when you're using it, and more importantly, when it's in use, it shouldn't be packed too tightly. This is because it needs empty space for the burn to happen. This is one reason why cannons, when they were initially being developed, 
weren't packed absolutely solid with powder, or rather they were often underpowered for what they were. This was also important as the initial combustion would also cause the reaction of well, gases to be generated, and this generation of gases would throw up the rest of the powder and expose it to the flame as well, and this in turn would lead to more combustion. In order for all of the contents to burn rapidly and effectively, they also need to be the smallest possible size and mixed as much as possible. This is important as the smaller something is, the more surface area there is relative to the volume. This is one of the big reasons why a lot of early black powder was very granulated. The granules gave lots of surface area rather than trying to make a simple cake or solid mass of powder that could be arguably more standardized but certainly not easily combusted. Whereas if you had it too finely ground it would combust too quickly and you would have much too explosion. Arguably, uh, this process is also one of the reasons why a flash pan or similar element to a rifle, pistol, or cannon from the earliest times it works so well. It let the reaction spread into the combustion chamber. Uh, common black powders today include FG, which is used for large caliber rifles and cannons, although uh, generally speaking, small cannons, FFG, used for rifles and for black powder cartridges. FFFG for handguns, shotguns, and small caliber rifles, and 4FG, which is used for priming powder for flintlocks, small handguns, blanks, and pinfires. One of the big distinguishing features of gunpowder or black powder versus modern propellants is that they have a very low energy density, about a third of what you would find by comparison. Although it's a going to vary somewhat based on the exact grind of the powder, slight variations in composition and so on, but as a general rule you could say that black powder is about a third the power of modern propellants, and it's why the amount of black powder used in a musket was large comparative to the size of the shot that was being used, and why they didn't go very far but they had a lot of power behind them. This leads us to the modern propellant options, and effectively smokeless powder. This was developed in 1884 by VL, and it was called Powder B, or Podre B, short for white powder. This was a French development, which is surprising given that, well, most French wars end with a white flag. But bad jokes about French surrendering aside, it was made by taking nitrocellulose, about 70%, about 30% soluble nitrocellulose, which was gelatinized using ether and paraffin. So you had a solid mass and a liquid version of exactly the same thing. The reason the French chemist developed this was actually for a military rifle, which is why it was as successful as it was. It effectively became the first mainstream military example of smokeless powder, and why we have it today. It was used in a Lebel rifle round, which was an 8x50 Lebel round. By the turn of the 19th century, and only a few decades before World War I, we had the next, let's say, major development in this, a cordite. A cordite is effectively the start of modern smokeless powder on a scale that could be considered global. Whether it's artillery shells, rifles, grenades, and even blasting for mining. A cordite distinguishes itself considerably from, well, black powder to start with by Rather than relying on the uh, size of the grind, it's rather the shape of the, well, let's say combustion or combustible products that determine its burning rate and from there the rate at which it generates power. Because only the uh, surface of the piece of the uh, cordite that's exposed to the primer is going to burn, larger pieces will burn more slowly, and so this is going to help you control how much power is generated, but in some cases even that's not enough, and so particularly thinking of rifle rounds, there may also be flame deterrent coatings that slow down or retard the burning slightly. The intent of this is to regulate the burn rate and give you constant pressure. This means the bullet comes out the end of the barrel at the same speed and you don't get variability. In some cases, 
the cordite itself may also have perforations to stabilize the burn rate to increase it or retard it in certain ways. So if you have more perforations towards the start of the burn, it will burn faster. If you have them towards the end, it will burn faster at the end of that. As a, a very general rule, pistol rounds will have a faster burning powder because, well, there is significantly less of it, and generally speaking, the barrel is shorter than a rifle round would, let alone something like a tank cannon or artillery shell. At least in terms of history, Cordite itself well, began as a roughly 65% gun cotton and 30% nitroglycerin composition along with a small amount of petroleum jelly to keep it stable, along with a small amount of acetone. This was pretty much the standard recipe towards the end of the 1800s. This was also known as Cordite MD, or Cordite Modified. The cartridges for a rifle generally weighed more than the earlier Cordite cartridges, but they had the same muzzle velocity, but they also were slightly less powerful, so you had less kickback from the rifle, or effectively, and you had the same stopping power. During World War I, this had to be changed though, and it's largely down to the fact that the acetone, that small 0.8% acetone, it simply could not be sourced in Britain, and so they had to find ways around it. This led to a uh, slight change in the recipe. Rather than relying on gun cotton, it became 52% collodion, 40% nitroglycerin, and 6% petroleum jelly. So it's a small change, but by taking away the acetone, they didn't need that solvent, and that was useful in some respects. The reasons it was useful, particularly given the nature of World War II, was the fact that, well, Britain was an island that was effectively under siege. But more importantly, Britain had a very large navy, and the navy used cordite. Because it used cordite, they kind of had to find a way around that. If you couldn't, if, if you couldn't load guns on a ship and you couldn't fight the Germans, you were going to lose your country very soon. The second issue with this is that, well, the cordite that was being used is kind of corrosive. It's actually a bit nasty in that respect. And as a result, well, they had to change it. This kept their battleships in working order for longer. It meant they weren't reliant on shipments of something like acetone from America, or better yet, having to run through the cordon by the Germans. Later in World War II, they found another, let's say, alternative mixture. And this was the first, or earliest, more likely to say, of the triple base propellants. It was using nitroguanidine. So they could take this and they could add it, and this became cordite N or NQ. It depends on where it was being used. So, for example, if it was in artillery or tanks, it was a different composition to what the Navy used. By uh, taking away the, uh, well, solvents that were in use at the time, it dealt significantly with the muzzle erosion of, well, particularly capital ships of the British Navy, where, well, if you have to replace a 200 kilogram or 200 ton barrel, that's a lot of work, and it's not something that's done overnight. But the other side to that is, well, gun flash. If you're an artillery or a tank, you don't want the enemy knowing where you are by seeing a flash of light. Now onto those triple base propellants. Now, as mentioned, these were a development that basically took the idea of, well, black powder, smokeless powder with the cordite, and then built on it again. By having the nitrocellulose, or in some cases nitroglycerin, they could have a lot of power, but it was also, generally speaking, a rather corrosive substance. By using a significant amount of nitroguanidine in lieu of these, they're able to, as mentioned, reduce the issue. Now, the downside to this is that it took something of a step back to black powder, in that it did make more smoke. And as a result, you don't really find the, well, triple base propellants used for, well, rifles and pistols, it's almost exclusively for very large caliber weapons. So think of artillery and ships. You're not going to find it in any rifles, really. You may also find it, depending on what's being used and where you are, used for tank guns. 
and this is all down to bore erosion. Pretty much they wanted to avoid the issue of having to replace the barrels on a more regular basis because the, well, propellant was sort of destroying them. In the uh, latter part of the 20th century, even that's now being replaced with more RDX-based explosives in use and more nitroguanidine-based explosives. So we're gaining slightly in terms of the velocity up to another 500 meters per second, but ultimately not really having any downside, so to say. The simple advantages of smokeless powder over black powder is that, well, you can use a smaller round in the case of infantry, so it weighs less. This is arguably more lethal than black powder, but lighter, and therefore your average soldier or hunter can carry more ammunition. The other advantage is that, well, they operate at high pressure. That will send a bullet down the barrel at a high speed. That also leads to a few downsides. If the casing should break or the breech not seal correctly and the round is detonated out of battery, the resulting consequence is an explosion in the face of the shooter. Each bullet and cartridge must also be sealed to keep the ammunition in working order. And much like black powder, which needed to be kept dry, but to an extent, each bullet with a cordite or double base propellant still needs to be kept sealed to ensure it will continue to work. This is also slightly less convenient compared to black powder where, arguably, the gun is prepared each time to fire and you don't need to worry about it being sealed. There are no issues around the condition of the projectile to ensure a proper fit, or for that matter, the bolt itself. However, black powder must be kept dry and moisture free, and significantly more so is this a concern given that, well, it doesn't come in its own handy container. The inconvenience is somewhat mitigated by the fact that it is a low pressure explosive. That is, the barrel or bore is unlikely to break from black powder. This does also mean any shot is going to be slower and with significantly less power than your smokeless propellant would be. The other downside to black powder is that because it and the byproducts of reactions are hydroscopic, it has somewhat of a greater corrosive effect on the barrel. The same byproducts also fail any rifling in the barrel, making it less than desirable for rifled guns. That means if you want to be a sharpshooter, you're going to be out of luck using black powder, or at least you are going to be unless you're willing to clean your gun after every couple of shots. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.